This is Bewilderbeasts, an infotainment show dedicated to inspiring curiosity for all ages by investigating the ways animals intersect at humanity. I am not a historian, an ethologist, a researcher, a scientist, a zoologist, a trained audio engineer, or an expert in, well, anything. Y'all, I'm lucky if I can remember to put my clean laundry in the dryer before it gets funky. And while I make every effort to present things as accurately as I can with a fun flair, I'm going to mess up. And that's okay. I hope I've given you a nice place to jump off from on your own adventures into curiosity. Or at the very least, I've given you the key to win your next round of trivia. Hello and welcome back to Bewilderbeasts. I'm your host, Melissa McHugh McGrath, recording right here, right now. And today we're going to learn about Tony. And you are not ready. Ready? I already told you you're not. But all right, let's go. This story comes way of a Twitter thread that I saw about Tony. Now, If you don't know about Tony, he was this little green frog that ended up nearly in someone's salad. And according to Simon Curtis, an author of a book that I want to read called Boy Robot, about what makes us human, which, given last week's episode on RoboFish, might be an important read anyway, he found Tony in his romaine lettuce container from Whole Foods. Talk about all natural. But he wanted to let Tony free, but he wasn't sure if it was warm enough where he lived or if it was ethical enough to free a frog into an area where he might not be a native species. I would really like to think that Simon is a fan of this show and has heard all the cautionary tales herein. Good thinking Simon. So he used Twitter for good because someone had to, and he ended up getting the attention of some people who actually study and work and could give qualified ethical advice about whether or not Tony the Frog should be kept as a pet or freed into the wilderness. Yes, this kind of frog was native to the area, so that was great news, but there was also a huge concern with disease spread among tree frogs right now, of which Tony happened to be one. And as he likely traveled hundreds of miles away to the Whole Foods in somewhere Arizona, it could absolutely devastate the tree frog population. Then y'all, this thread gets weird. Petco chimed in to help get Tony the frog a little terrarium, gave a $500 gift certificate to Simon, but that's not all. Simon, using his platform again for good, suggested that Petco also match this incredibly kind donation to a wildlife conservation fund or children's environmental education organization or something good. And they agreed. Yay, Simon. So now Tony the Frog is living large after escaping a few times, perching behind a few bottles of shampoo in the shower, which led to a series of panic tweets from Simon about, I lost Tony again and I can't find him, and one amazing feat of frog superpower where Tony somehow climbed to the top of a doorway to hide up on high. How Simon found him all the way up there, this is a teeny tiny frog, like half the size of your thumb, is beyond me, but he was found. And he was gifted the terrarium in his safe, and Tony's story is going on to help lots of kids in some conservation efforts too. But this is the intro. This is not the story for today. This episode isn't the Tony show. Oh, no. This is just the intro, y'all. Go read the whole thread on Tony by finding Simon Curtis on Twitter, at Simon Curtis. He has a little blue check mark by his name and everything. And search for Tony the Frog. The saga starts on 12-2021. And it's a couple weeks long, but the Tony thread is so good. You'll laugh, you'll cry, you'll gasp, you'll cheer, you'll see experts weigh in. It's so good. And I learned about tree frogs and diseases and how to use Twitter for good and not evil. This episode, however, was inspired by a single response to the tweet in the thread. And it has to do with the thousands of animals and critters that end up in your salad fixins every year. And one scientist who rescues those creatures from certain death. So let's go to Australia. (music) 
First, Australia, I'm sorry. I always poke fun, as everyone does, at all the times in which your nature tries to kill everyone. Milking funnel spiders. Cane toads, which, okay, admittedly, that was the United States wildlife trying to kill people in Australia because they were invasive, so that one's on us. But your pyromaniac predatory birds who light fires to catch escaping prey, that's on you. So I figured it's equally important to make mention when your wildlife is just being regular, non-murdery wildlife, and this is one of those really cool stories. I do love you, Australia. I do. So our story starts with a tweet within the Twitter thread I just mentioned above from S.F. Brennan, Sharon Brennan. She said, Here in Australia, this often happens with bananas and other Queensland produce. There's a rescue group. Sharon, I'm interested. So Sharon linked one article from abcnet.au for Australia that talks about a growing problem with frogs hitching rides and bananas and other produce. How this frog conservation effort led to frog rescue instead of euthanizing frogs due to a rapid decline in frog populations, because fungus, we'll get to it in a minute, and you would think with the words stowaway frog rescue group, there would be way more hits in the search engines, but y'all, it really, really doesn't. Even going to the organization heading the rescue effort, the Frog and Tadpole Study Group, unfortunately abbreviated as FATS, doesn't seem to have a ton of information on the rescue part of this site. However, we do know that there is a rescue group in Australia that is helping super jumping stragglers and they're very successful, but finding information on it was incredibly hard. So let's look at some things that we do know and that we can easily look up. I had actually cut a piece from a previous Bewilderbeast episode, the episode on gender fluidity in the animal kingdom. I had hoped to use it as a Patreon bonus, but it seems so perfect to hop up on this piece. (laughs) Hehe, see what I did there? Hop, frog. Okay, I'll work on it. I removed this section from the particular episode for two reasons. One, I had a ton of examples of animals already swapping sex already, and the episode was running incredibly long. And two, this section was a bit darker than the rest of the piece, and it was a standalone chunk, but I think it will set up nicely here. So here's a bit of a downer, but incredibly important to understand the bigger issue as to why groups like bats exist to help frogs. So buckle in, let's go. Atrazine. One of the most common pesticides on the planet has been proven to really mess up the hormone levels of frogs. Not a little bit, pretty significantly. One in every 10 male frogs become female when exposed to this chemical. One in 10. That might not seem like a whole lot, but imagine your high school. Assume 50% men, 50% women. In my school of 820 students, 410 were likely male, which means 41 of those males would walk out in the immortal words of Lizzo, feeling good as hell. 75%, three quarters of the male frogs, 75 out of 100 frogs cannot produce offspring at all. They are effectively castrated. No working sperm can get out to make the baby frogs. They are essentially a dead end in the tree of frog life. What is happening? Well, essentially, the testosterone levels are so greatly reduced in male frogs when they are exposed to atrazine that they just can't make babies, which really puts a damper on frog populations. Here's the kicker. Remember that one out of every 10 male frogs that somehow magically turn female? Because these frogs are genetically male, something interesting happens. Yes, they can mate as a female frog. They can have offspring with the 15 out of male 100 frogs who can somehow magically, by the grace of frog god, reproduce enough viable, living, actively working sperm to create baby froglets, or tadpoles. But because they are genetically male, with the functions of a female frog body, males with ovaries producing eggs, laying eggs, and minding the babies, their DNA that they are passing on is still male. They can only have male baby frogs. The now female frogs can only give male DNA. And the males that they are mating with to make baby frogs can also only give male DNA. Meaning, there are no females being born from these mutated frogs. So I'm not a biologist, but this is really bad looking down the road. 
and it's totally preventable. We did this. We have this terrible chemical spraying everywhere willy-nilly, and the repercussions are pretty incredible, and not in a good way. Just to put it out there for those who may not think, well, this is maybe a naturally occurring thing. Let's let nature sort it out. There are no documented cases of male frogs trading in their testicles for ovaries in the natural, normal circumstances of the world. This is unambiguous. Humans are doing this. Its effects are far more reaching than local male frogs. So let's first look at male frogs that are thousands of miles away from where farmers in the Midwest of the United States are spraying crops with atrazine. Yep, thousands of miles away. Frogs are showing up with eggs in their testes. While the males have much lower testosterone levels, it's the female frogs who are suffering too. Think in humans. You may not think of testosterone in females, but hey, I have a range of testosterone in my body like you do too. It doesn't matter if you were assigned male at birth or female at birth or neither or neither. You too have both testosterone and estradiol in your system, in your body, controlling all sorts of things. And that range is different for everyone, which is why the human binary is stupid and should just be poof, gone. These female frogs, as a direct result of pollutants that affect testosterone, a hormone that is not usually associated with femininity, but is present, have much smaller voice boxes. And it's mighty hard if you're a frog to call for a mate when your voice box is small. Do do you remember the little mermaid? Yeah, she couldn't call out either because her voice box was taken by Ursula. Ugh, she was the worst. Anyway, 80 million pounds of atrazine, an herbicide used to control weeds and increase crop yield, does stop weeds. It does increase crop yield. But it's so prevalent, the most common pesticide that contaminates water. Yes, even groundwater. Looking at you, well water drinkers. Ew. More research shows that atrazine, while netting more corn, is really messing with both estrogen and testosterone in fish, amphibians like our frog friends, reptiles, rodents, and yes, people. Gasp. There are possible links between birth defects in human babies, low birth weight, and exposure to this horrific pesticide while babies are still in the womb not even able to eat the food that these crops are sprayed with to net more of that crop. Y'all, this is affecting everyone. The EU banned it, so we're gonna have to here in the States, right? All that info I just gave, frogs, people, mice, reptiles, that was from 2010. Better now, right? Right? (sighs) In September of 2020, the year that has all the amazing gifts, a press release EPA widely used pesticide atrazine likely harms more than a thousand endangered species. Finding comes two months after agency reapproved herbicide for 15 years. The Trump EPA announced that it would be reapproving atrazine for the next 15 years, eliminating long-standing safeguards for children's health and allowing 50% more atrazine to end up in U.S. waterways. The Center for Food Safety, Center for Biological Diversity, and a coalition of public interest groups sued to challenge the decision last week. Well, that's not great. Not only have we not banned it, we have increased permissions for using more of this chemical. America. Which is my reminder to all of y'all, don't forget to vote, especially in the years where a president is not on the ballot because of this next part. When it comes to chemicals like atrazine, the Biden administration is currently reviewing the Trump administration's past decisions. Basically, Biden's looking at what Trump people did. And that's a good thing. Cool, 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 cool. Remember, Trump's folks said, nah, it's good for another 15 years. Frogs are stupid. I mean, I'm obviously paraphrasing probably not by much, but the legal stuff is stayed in the courts. So staying a case is legal gibberish for time out. As these findings are coming out, and here's why voting is important in every election, it's unsurprising that every single Republican at the federal level 
is suggesting that it's unfair to undo what Trump's administration did and that this can hurt farmers, food, crops. And while that may be true, chemicals in groundwater, water, water, other food is killing animals and human birth defects and more seems like maybe the pros of using this chemical is not outweighing the cons. (laughs) These things are hurting everyone thousands of miles away. There has to be another way. So environmental groups have lobbied for atrazine to be banned entirely based on concerns about human health risks, environmental problems, you know, water. And it seems like those decisions will come out in the not too distant future. So stay tuned. So end past script and back to the present. This is just one, a singular one, uno, example of why frogs of all kinds are in all sorts of peril, not just here in the United States, but all over the world. Populations are declining, climate change, pesticides, invasive species, all of it. This is a tale as old as very recent time in the grand scheme of things. And as one other issue is when humans go to get a head of lettuce at Whole Foods, they might be surprised to find a Tony, literally chillin', in the bottom of a container after hitching a ride from who knows where. See, in the 1970s and 80s, the idea of plummeting populations of frogs were suspected to be disease-motivated. So frogs were just euthanized if they were found in South Wales and Australia from out of state or overseas, which happened a lot. Whoops. The Frog and Tadpole Study Group, again, that's G, negotiated with the authorities to pick up stowaway frogs and put them into quarantine. We all know what quarantine is now. So the frogs were put into quarantine, but unfortunately, they could never be released into the wild, but were suitable pets. So it turns out that Fats G, the best frog rap group ever, started out in 1991 as an offshoot of the Australian Herpetological Society. But they were feeling like they weren't getting enough floor time as frog enthusiasts. They branched off. They hopped out of this little group and made their own branch. And according to the website, nine hearty souls attended that first meeting, but there were 15 apologies. Yo, I've been to those meetings. (laughs) A small group of people show up, but most people are like, I gotta get my hair done. But it was clear that while the parent group was focused on breeding programs and keeping pet snakes safe and healthy... The frog folk wanted to focus on the environmental and conservation concerns of wild frogs. How to keep plummeting numbers from plummeting. This was important. So these froggy folk banded together and took incredible data, often collected by volunteers. There are notes of a couple at a time just standing in the dark counting frogs in swamps. Man, you really gotta love what you do if you're standing in a swamp in the dark counting frogs. But then again, who am I to talk? I clean up more dog poop and vomit in a year than anyone I know. And I have two animals in my house right now who do all of their dirty business in a box in my basement that I get to clean. So, okay, okay, I get it. But Fats G then did something incredible. Q Conan. In the year 2000, the Frog Rescue Service handled almost two thousand frogs. Many of them were called banana box frogs. As it was clear that there were issues that these frogs were getting into bananas and being shipped all over state lines, of which again, remember, once they cross state lines, they can never be released into the wild. And many of them were accidentally gassed when green bananas were exposed to ethylene. This is a part of the processing plant where your, your green bunch of bananas, they are picked before they are ripe. They go the, to where they need to go to be processed. Little frog is hitching a little ride. They go into a room and are gassed with ethylene. Ethylene is the thing that kind of wakes up your bananas to say, okay, start turning yellow. So when you go to the grocery store, those slightly green bananas become yellow over a period of a few days. But That's really bad for frogs, and many of them died when they were exposed to ethylene. So it was imperative to work on the ground before these frogs were even shipped out to prevent them from being gassed and euthanized. 
So in 2005, the Fats G group was rescuing 1,500 frogs a year. Again, for those in the back, 1,500 frogs were saved every single year in this one area of Australia. Not all from bananas and lettuce. But y'all, this is wild. By just taking the time and talking with banana growers directly, you know, a conversation, face-to-face, the growers now look at all the bananas before they're ever put on a truck. And as a result of being found on site, they, these frogs are safely released to go and have frog babies and live a long, happy, froggy life. How many frogs were saved? Well, according to Fats G F A Q, that's a lot of letters. The rescued frog numbers have absolutely gone down, which is amazing. However, 200 to 300 frogs every year are still coming through the service by way of food. So in 2005, there were about 500 volunteers all over the region who were just taking in frogs or organizing veterinary care, including making teeny little prosthetics for frogs who were hit by cars or like little little splints, like tiny tree frog Tim. There was a 24-hour day hotline and an on-call volunteer that would stay up all night just to save frogs. Some, like Dr. Arthur White, who's the president of Fats Q, runs a quarantine station in his home so frogs that are accidentally hitching rides to Sydney do not have to be euthanized as a precaution against funguses and diseases. Oh, and this is great. Remember episode 18, the cane toad one? That hotline for emergencies is also set up to help with reporting cane toad sightings. So one offshoot of the Frog Rescue Service has been that the Cane Toad Alert Program, teeny, teeny tiny little tree frogs who wanted to see the world were hopping free rides on bananas and lettuce, but someone else was hitching a ride to cane toads. So if you recall, these invasive species were killing a lot of critters, including curious dogs who lick them and have damaged lots of people and killed a few who watched YouTube looking for a quick high. So Fats embarked on several community cane toad control programs, which was a good thing. So if you think that this is just an Australian thing that you don't have to worry about your lettuce or a Twitter thing, it's not. According to a 2019 article from journalistresource.org, In 21 of the 40 reported incidents, consumers found frogs and toads, reptiles, lizards, snakes, accounted for nine incidents, while mammals, mammals, like rodents and bats, accounted for seven. Customers discovered birds in three cases, and most animals were dead when discovered. But at least 10 incidents involved live animals, including nine live frogs, like Tony. On average, between 2008 and 2018, Incidents were reported in 20 states. Eight states had two incidents. Texas and Florida had the most. Shocking. Florida had the most diverse spread. A rodent, a bat, and two amphibians and a bird. I wonder if it was a partridge in a pear tree. But some misconceptions about food and stowaways? The biggest misconception found was that if you find a critter in organic food, the idea is, well, yeah, it's organic. So you have to expect that with a big, duh, implied. However... When the journalist Chloe Richelle looked at the (gasps) data and did a little (gasps) diving, she found actually that the opposite was true. Someone is three times more likely to get a frog, a bird, a grasshopper, someone in their hummus wrap if they buy conventionally produced food, not organic. The other thing to consider is that there is zero difference between the large organic labels and the regular old pesticide-y farmy labels on large industrial scales. Basically, if big company X has both organic and non-organic food, there is not a big fence or a separate field way over there with non-spray stuff. It's just one big field with a teeny tiny sign that says, just don't spray here. This is the organic food. The frogs, the snakes, the birds, the spiders, literally everyone who lives in farm food will absolutely be in both the organic and the non-organic lettuces. It is more likely that you're going to find a critter in your food if you buy it in a bag. Think about it. Loose veggies without bags have several opportunities for the little hopper to hop away. But once they're in the bag, the plastic box, the container of any kind, 
Tree frogs are trapped, snakes are stowed away, beetles are bound. And lastly, and this is incredibly important, when news articles end with the animal living, or in the case of Tony, surviving, the conversation quickly turns to pulling in Elsa and let it go. Reporters especially want these stories to end with a happy, feel-good ending. We let it go into the wild to be free and live forever. But as I learned in the Tony the Frog Twitter thread from Dr. Arthur White's documentation on Bats G and the journalist article on responsible reporting, letting creatures go is, as weird as it sounds, the worst thing you can do. (laughs) Yes, frog populations are plummeting. They are absolutely in trouble for a lot of reasons that I've listed through this piece and dozens more. However, some of those reasons are fungal diseases and other diseases that can absolutely spread to frog and other animal populations. Even if a frog is native to the area, it might have come from somewhere else entirely and has picked up a disease that can unwittingly spread to other animals in your backyard, your ecosystem, and that is way worse. So what do you do? Well, if you're in Australia, you are so lucky because you have Fats G. Someone please, please make me a Fats G frog. Please. It's all I'm thinking about right now. Like a little rap group, fat little frog, (laughs) like a little microphone. Anyway, go to fats.org slash au. And if you didn't know that this was a frog organization, you might think it was a liposuction facility. It's not. It's a, it's froggy goodness, and they are doing amazing things. And most of their information is not on the frog rescue tab. It's under their FAQ, which is not where I was initially looking. So poke around on the site, see if there are events near you. They have a YouTube channel. I could only find two videos, but they're still fun. If you search for Dr. Arthur White Frog, you'll find some of his articles where he is talking about his life's work in helping these frogs. If you are not in New South Wales, which I am not, the thing to do is to wash your hands a whole lot and then either keep your critter as a pet or donate it to a classroom. And if all goes well, Tony the Twitter tree frog was a healthy young froglet. He should have his own Twitter account to stay in touch with his fans. He already has followers but has plenty of time to grow his numbers as the American green tree frog can live up to six years. But others, like the Australian green tree frog, they can live up to 30 years. That is a lifetime commitment. So, lessons learned. Wash your lettuce, especially the bagged stuff, even if it's triple washed. This way you can find stowaways. Then wash your hands because potential frog goo. Then get a standby terrarium and have it at the ready, just in case. And the most important lesson, if your mom will not let you get a pet reptile, surprise her. Ask her to buy you more bagged lettuce. Your chances will increase threefold, if it's not organic, in finding your own Tony. But your chances of growing healthy and big and strong increase 100%. So it's kind of a win-win. Y'all, thank you for joining me today on Bewilder Beasts. If you want to go back and listen to the Cane Toad episode, it is episode 18, The Side Effects of Toad Licking. Also, you know the drill by now. Check out patreon.com slash bewilderbeasts. And thank you, patrons, for supporting this show. You have paid the hosting fees and recording costs, and I can't thank you enough. It is a lovely way to start the year. Mwah! Bonus episodes for everyone at a dollar a month, extra goodies like letters and stickers, a personal RSS feed for episodes just for you. Eternal gratitude. And if you hop over there right now, I just put up a whole episode on a punk rocking goat, a goat who was saved from slaughter, who ended up changing the punk rock metal grindcore scene. (laughs) Guys, it's weird and really, really cool. So if you're interested in hearing about any animals on the podcast, know of historical animals who changed the world, animals who help humans, or educational animal rescue organizations who are doing the work on the ground. Send them in. BewilderBeastPod at gmail.com. Tweet at BewilderBeastPod, BewilderBeastPod on Facebook, and BewilderBeast on Instagram. 
I'm Melissa McHugh McGrath with Mud Stuff Media, author of Considerations for the City Dog. I'm doing dog training, virtual consults, nose work classes, all sorts of fun stuff. So check it out. Now go get curious. I got today's information from journalistsresource.org. Thank you. That's .org, which is a frog website, not a liposuction center. Total Environment Care at tec.org.au. Twitter.com slash Simon Curtis. His status starting on 12-20-2021 is the Tony Saga. Go and read it. abc.net.au. And lastly, at FF Brennan on Twitter. Thank you, Sharon Brennan, for tweeting about the green grocer frog rescue thing. This, thank you. I, I can't thank you enough. I don't even know you, but thank you. Links, as always, are in the description of today's episode. Intro music is Tiptoe Out the Back by Dan Leibowitz. Interstitial music is by MK2. Additional music provided by Pixabay and Freesound.org. Don't forget, like, subscribe, review, share with your curious friends. <laughs> Let Tony know that he inspired an entire episode if anybody happens to know who Simon is. And thanks so much for listening. I can't wait to talk to you next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.